Okay. There we go. First of all, um, may I request that you turn off your cell phones? Please. We have an approval in the back there, thank you. Um, this will be odd enough without the intervening sounds of phones going off, so. Set them to stun. Yeah, really. No, whose pocket they are, yes. Um, the second hobby obsession of my life is this blasted carpet there was covered. A little personal history. When I was when I was 13 years old in the eighth grade. When I was 13 years old and in the eighth grade, this model came out. It was it was in um, July or so of '64. And I'd followed the Bitten magazines because my dad would always bring me home car crafts and rod and custom. You see, he was the one that sent me on these, on these waves. And I, I, I was intrigued by the car, so I was cutting lawns and washing cars and spending all my money at the local hobby store to buy predictor kits. That's, a, that's no, no joke. I mean, seriously, I must have bought seven or eight of them. I built them all appallingly bad. Glue all over the canopy, misfitting doors, misfitting engines. Could never get one together. It certainly never looked good. And I eventually, when I was about 16, just gave up. I thought, I'm just, it's never going to happen. Well, I grew up and um, acquired some modest skills. And I, in 1978, I decided that I was going to write a book on, on the car and that I wanted to build some good scale models of it. At that point, I was just involved in scale auto, and I thought, well, heck, if I can build that stuff, I can build this. Got a hold of Daryl Starbird, a wonderful, wonderful, gracious guy, including his wife Donna. They started a a correspondence with me that lasted from 1979 through just about a year ago, by the time of Don, two years ago, the time of Donna's death. And they would share photographs and reminiscences, and I was off on a, on a tear, um, contacting uh, the, the um, Peterson Library for photographs that I'd licensed for my book, um, talking to anybody else, talking to the guy that owned the car once. I talked to the editor of, of Model, Cars, Model Cars Science, which magazine gave the car away in a contest in 1970. I went everywhere. Um, it, it, was, it was astonishing and weird. Um, but I was on my way. It was, it, was, it was this youthful kind of preoccupation. I don't know what the devil it was. A psychologist would have a lot to say about it. Please don't <laughs> tell me what they would say. Um, but I learned that the car had been re restyled for, for monogram. The monogram required him to paint it red that he really didn't want to, but the kit was going to be red plastic, and so that's the way that went. Um, and so on, on I went. And so um, I started the book maybe eight, nine, seven or eight years ago, gathering photographs the whole time. People still contact me. There's a fellow on the West Coast, Mark Weller. Mark here? Um, Mark Weller found some pictures at the, at the store in California where a guy had essentially taken a pedal car chassis and made a predict out of it. <laughs> um, it it's kind of cool. So he sent me pictures while he did. Um, it, it's been a, a weird sort of journey. Let's just share a couple of pictures before I show you some artifacts and so forth. Whoops. Well, anyway, there. That's the title Bob Wick designed for the website. Just a bit of history in the car, and I do mean only a bit, because in prior six or seven times, we've gone through this car and measured every square inch of what was defective and what wasn't. And the car was formed. This is the car was started. This car was hit by something very serious, as you can see on its right side. Starboard picked it up for 150 or $200 from his buddy that ran, ran the local uh, junkyard. Um, uh, it's amazing. So, again, we're jumping around. Um, <laughs> He went out and, and got some other spare parts to, to repair the one side, got a spare door. Uh, the frame, interestingly, wasn't bent, he said. Who knows, it, just a sheet metal hit, but a bad one. So he started to build it in September, oh, that's not true, late, mid-August of 1959. So he went down to the, to the GM dealership and bought 259, excuse me, 260 Buick rear fenders and grabbed them on the car you see him welding on the door there, doing the roll panel, working on the other side of the car. See, at one time, the car did not have horizontal headlights. It had vertical ones. And look at this character line in the early shot that comes down the side of the car, and look. Oh, I'm so incompetent. Oh, there. 
See this? That's the vertical headlight pod. At least the vestiges of to start with. And there comes the carriage to line down the car. It was simply a piece of rolled, uh, used a lot of steel conduit. He just welded it in place, brazed it in place, and then let it over the top. Didn't use much bond on the first, first iteration. You see the car, it's got the tiller steering. It's, it's a combination of a 58 Chrysler um, steering section, sector and a 55 Thunderbird. So one thing activated the shift rod, the other one forward on a tiller system. It's amazing. It's just, as Bob Wick did discover when he drew this thing out, it, it's really astonishing. The car showed up first in Carcraft Magazine. When I talked to uh, Peterson, um, now, Motor Trend Group, I think. They own all the photographs after that huge project they had at the Peterson Library to rescue all the original negatives. There were about a million and a quarter of them. They rescued them all. And each photograph with him now is 35 milligram, mil, megabytes? No, megabytes. Each image is 30, 35 megabytes. They're enormously large. Steve Rolliage rescued some of those for me. Um, but we, we have, I licensed some of these for the book. Look what's interesting here. Look at this front end. This is just tubing that he plated copper and just held in place. The upper sheet metal here dips in, so this thing has a shape like this in the front. It's, a, it's amazing. This was a satellite blue, 50, mid 60s, mid 50s, Chrysler color. These are 59 Cadillac taillights that were painted white. Well, let me thank you. Got a kiss of mine. It, it's, it's hard to get an attorney to learn two techniques at one time. <laughs> no. Walk and chew gum. <laughs> if that. Um, these are 59 Cadillac taillights. They bought in quantity, of course, sprayed them white. There are three here. You don't see them. There's one here, one here. Those are red. Okay. All of these were screwed to apply a thigh or um, what did you do with wood and you darkened it? Metal is plywood. Really? And that's how the car went together. This is another car from the Peterson shoot. Shot there. He won the, the Motor Life Car of the Year Award. That's him in 19, late 1961 at a, his favorite park near, near uh, his home in Kansas. Now, this is interesting. <coughs> When Mon Graham contacted him in late 1963, late 1963, no, excuse me, 60, late 62, they wanted to model the car. The question then was, which version? Because this is not the original version. The reverse rim, rims are off it. Um, the, the front end has a chrome wrap and not the tubing. Um, and, and so they had to they, they trailer the car back to Mon Graham from, from Kansas. And they shot this picture. See, would you go get that piece of artwork over here? That is this. In 1991, um, Monogram gave me all of the original kit photographs. This is the original photograph. I just had hold it up to me. I just had bound a while ago. But, but um, you see, this was just they. There was no digital camera. There were no digital cameras in those days. It was just you know shooting on cellular. So they would back the car up and stationary camera and move the car a few inches and do their shot. Look up here and see how the, uh, right here in the picture, Steve, right here. You see how that wall's all screwed up? Mm -hmm. That wall is this wall. Well, you can't do anything with this. And this distorted the, the length of the recorder panel. So Steve rolled the eight, God bless your soul, Steve, took this image and cleaned it up digitally, spent about who knows how many hours, and produce this picture and fix the wall. This picture can't exist. Because remember with this, they were, they were worried about parallax. Yeah. Okay? This thing is parallax personified. Except that the picture can't exist because the apparent distance from here to the camera and here to the camera and here is all the same distance. So it's complete belonging. That's one of the reasons that monogram got screwed up. Someone just wasn't using their head. Anyway, this picture was given to me um, what was the guy's name at, at Revell who was the, uh, the he was over here to tell me. Roger Harney? Roger Harney, God bless you. Who said that? Roger Harney. 
Thank you. Very good. Roger Harney, I, I made really good friends with him in the late 80s, early 90s. Roger Harney gave me everything, every, well, we thought at the time, everything Monogram had on the card, including this image and this image. Again, they're all pasted together. He also gave me all of the photographs that were taken of the car in, in the yard where they ran two inch tape over it. Remember, there was no digital scanning, so he had to run tape over it to define the shape. And that's one of the reasons I think I so screwed up. Thank you very much. So this, this was the image they were working from. This distance here is about six inches longer than it should be. This distance up here is about eight inches longer. And that's what they used. Until the car was delivered, I'll show you in a few minutes, until the car was restyled and delivered to them, parked in the warehouse next to another starboard creation, and they took a tape measure out to it and said, oh my gosh. Jeez. So then Starker took it back to his shop, tore it to the ground, restyled it, and so forth. He flared the wheel wells, got rid of this crazy ring on top here, and sunk the bubble down in the body, um, flared the wheels into here. This car had been driven a lot at this point. It had, you can see some hints of some of the dings on it. He drove it extensively. Um, was arrested once for um, driving it on the freeway down near, near uh, Kansas City. Someone thought it was a, oh, it was abandoned by the side of the road and someone said it, it was a, a, an alien ship from another planet that landed. <laughs> and, and they, it's a true story, I've got the police report, seriously. <laughs> and here's his hand scribbled police report. It's flying soccer, it's flying something or other, is on whatever this road is near, near Kansas. Go out and investigate, it was his car. It just ran out of gas. Because you fill the gas through the bubble. Mm. Okay, you open the bubble up, here's the pipe, or it's spilled gas all over the interior, which is kind of weird. But the thing was, then he sat at another car wash one day. The original shift lever for the automatic transmission um, was just a, a chrome rod with a little, like, ball on top. He broke the weld as he's sitting at this, at this burger joint. So he says he sits there for about three hours with his hand adroitly on the, the bubble, you know, his hands here, until everyone went home. Got out of the car, his buddies went down to the floor jack, jacked it up, and welded it back on into it home. I mean, he was like 29 at the time. It was completely wonderful and bizarre stories. <laughs> when he restyled it, here, here's the version. Uh, this, uh, this image has been cleaned up by, uh, by Steve Rovier, and we're going to use it in the book. But look at the difference. See, the top now is recessed. There's a ring now that's called planar with the, with the side of the body. Um, these are. Notice now, here's a critical point. You see this in-cut body line comes down here? It flares up flares and up over right the wheel well. The kit doesn't show that. The kit is also wrong in this mansion. The door's wrong, the front fender's wrong, the bubble top's wrong. But this is the, is the original image that he took, he started took before he delivered the card to Monogram. Years later, and we're jumping about 10 years later, when Monogram had stopped campaigning the kit, the advertisements from about 1966 on stopped including pictures of, of the Bredicta in the kit lineup. The, the little coffin was there and other things were there, other bizarre things were there. So they would monogram, I can't remember his name right now, they had a, a, like a foreman in the shop and they would load this car on a trailer and take the shows in the upper Midwest. Open trailer. Oh. In the winter. Oh. Well, look here now. Look at the dirt. They would drive it on bad roads. And look, if you could see this better, the wheel well is filled with dirt. Look at the dirty tire. And they would put it up on this flimsy display stand, wipe off the exterior surface with a chamois, I guess, and display the car with the sign, of course. So the car was starting to not be well respected at the company. So, let me back up. At, at this point, the car was um, taken back to the warehouse in 19. 1978, Carcraft carried an advertisement for the little coffin and predicted to sell them. They sold the little coffin to Daryl Starbird. Starbird didn't know this car was for sale. No one told him and he didn't see the ad. So the car stayed with Monogram. And that's one of the one of the roots that led off to this, this other situation. Now, one of the things that, that uh, Mr. Hardy gave me were all the blueprints the drawings that, that kit makers use to make the dies and so forth. I'll show you those. 
I have all of them. And they're all listed. A chart will be in the book. But you see down, you see down here, you see all of the dates. They're all 1963. See it's down here? You've got the name of the, of the artist, you've got the date. And these are pretty good. Bob Whitcoss, well, these are pretty good drawings in terms of professionalism and so forth. But I've got the whole set, there are like 60 of them. Mm -hmm. And so to preserve them, I had them all scanned by a client, and now they're on a flash drive. Here's the here's the uh, the dashboard so called. Here, yeah. This is upper upholstery. Here are all the dimensions for the kit, again, kit dimensions, not real card dimensions. And we'll get into that in a few minutes with uh, Lynn Coburn and, and Steve Roy. Yay. Front suspension. Yeah, Who's ever built this kit? Try to you try to get the front end together? <laughs> I mean, crude to be sure. It's a, it's a representation of a 56 Thunderbird front front suspension. And let me vary that. But here are the parts. Here's that design the parts for the kit. Now listen, now look at this. 1962. Look at what they're doing. Microphone. Look, look what they're doing here. The body is too tall, obviously dimensionally. There, this is the inner character line on the flip side of the fin. Okay, look how this this round this round shape does not intersect this line. This line should be down here, with this radius intersecting that line, and it isn't. This is what they used to do the the, the dies or whatever you want to call them for, for the first kit. So we're using we're just sampling. There are sixty of them after all. We're sampling to say there are sixty of them after all. Um, and they'll all be rep they'll be on the website with restrictions across the front, so no one can copy them. I'm under some restrictions. So here we are with the project. Here's the first kit. This was done by a famous artist. This is this is Chicago, and this is I can't remember the name of that tower. It's a real building. Everything else is belonging. But you'll notice here that the art shows this radius intersecting that line not seen on the car. You'll notice here also, this is too tall, it's too bulky. This wheel well is too large, but it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing. There's the side, the side shot. This, do we have this box here? Mm -hmm. Steve, do you have this box? Do we have the crucial box? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> As you might imagine, I've been collecting kit boxes for, I have several dozen of them. It's, it is obsessional. But here's the original, the original kit, the box art and so forth. Got his picture on the side, the end flap, features of the car, the model on this side. What did I just show you? His picture, a, a young looking, it's sort of a photograph, but it isn't. Do we have that kit? Steve, bring that kit box. That box with the kit boxes over here, really quick. Kit itself? You want to see? Yep. Just bring it over here. This one? Yeah. No. Yeah, no, they leave this here. The box? The, the other one. The, the, no. Yeah, just leave that here. Well, I can show it on this. The, the first three. thousand or so, the first thousand or so versions of the kit were in pearl red plastic. Problem is, they couldn't get, as Harney told me, they couldn't get the metallic powder to distribute evenly in the plastic. So it ended up having splotches in it. Come up, look at this. This is one I assembled, polished the plastic, and assembled right out of the box. It's got splotches over the fins, it, it's everywhere. You look at it, there are splotches. And, kit, and I was told by Harney that hobby store people were taking these kits back because buyers, kids, when we got them, and complained that the kit was defective. They didn't like the pretty plastic. They didn't like the different, different colors and so forth. So they're taken back, and there were enough taken back that Monogram said, oh my gosh, they stopped production, cleaned out the dyes of all this stuff, and ran that traditional red plastic that you all have seen. When you come up here, later look at it. The worst place is probably on the fins. And the other thing that's interesting about the fin, right here, this fin is not even. Bubble. It kind of bubbles like this. 
real subtly. Then on top of that, this line, look at the curve in it here. You see that? Someone screwed up. It's not just that this line is curvature, but the whole thing tucks inward. Oh, look at this later. Okay, look at the line down here. See where it tilts inward? Tilts inward here, and the splotches are really bad through here. Bad splotches here and on the front of the hood. Now, if a, if a hobby store ordered a case of kits, Monogram would send them out a, a, an assembled display model and one of these displays produced by Monogram in-house and shipped to the audience who bought just 12 kits. We have the mo assembled model. The early ones, of course, were the pearl plastic, later replaced with the red. This is one I put back together because I, I have an original box and I have this, this pearl red one. We sort of assemble it for historical purposes. But I have a solid red original when it came out of a hockey store that closed in the Chicago area about 10, 15 years ago. That'll be shown in the book. Yeah, here's the original one. This was assembled at the factory. See, I have not put that goofy, um, that goofy star thing here on the side. <laughs> this thing. It, it just always seemed kind of weird. But look at, look at this interesting part. You see the TV up here? which was always painted body color. At the factory, they matched that and painted that red. Because the interior is white. So they wanted it to look a little better, maybe give some visual relief, who the devil knows. But this is literally the piece that was sent to this hobby store. This guy just packed it away. Then the second kit came out. They wanted to repack, the monogram's going through a repackaging of, of its uh, kits at this point. And so they took a picture of this. Everyone thought, that this was taken to the Irrigado show, except the Irrigado show doesn't contain any records that show the car was ever displayed there. Who knows where this picture was taken? It's an actual photograph. <clears throat> the color is not correct. It's way too dark, way too cinnamon -y, too metallic. But that's what they use. You notice how they change the background to be a little more stylish and avant-garde. See this? Here's the third issue. This is a dent, this, I bought it with plastic on here. Notice the difference in, in the box art, the upper right hand corner. What's the year of that one, Mark? 67. Now this is interesting. Um, in 1994 or five, I was, I had some business dealings with Ed Sexton who was then working for Monogram. And our deal was, I sold him stuff, he sold him stuff. He sent me two kits of the New Zealand version of this. New Zealand. We later found out that they shipped dyes, we think, to New Zealand. They ran them there in this appalling brownish, reddish color, just awful. And the box opened from the end. It wasn't the lid, it came open at the end. I have two of these now. <clears throat> More of the box art on the side. Comparison of the, of the box head, box art. Again, as styles change. Okay, here's the one from New Zealand. You see the end flap? Mm -hmm. The instruction sheet matched the original one, but I don't know what they copied it. I can scarcely read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard to read, seriously. But they made a couple of thousand issues of the kit and then shipped the dice back to, to, to Morton Grove. You tell me. <laughs> Here's that original factory produced kit and the interior that they built. Oh, you notice here, they put a speck of dark paint on the gauges. I did not do that. Now, as I told you, one of the real problems was with the kit that it wasn't even close to being accurate, either in appearance or certainly not in dimension. So when I had these photographs, I started to play with them, shot black, black and white prints of them, marked them up and so forth. Um, I asked a good friend, Lynn Coburna, sits right there, to go visit Daryl Starbird. I made arrangements with Starbirds and Lynn got on a jet plane and went back there with all these pictures and took dozens of measurements. 
Then you want to talk just for a few minutes about that experience you had back there? Sure. One of the real treats of my model car experience was going to uh, flying to Tulsa and then to uh, visit Daryl and his dear wife Donna Starbird at the National Hot Rod Museum that he had in Oklahoma. And uh, when I got there, Daryl gave me the tour of the place very graciously and it, it is so magical. And I believe that's owned by Clay... Nailman, yes. Yeah. Um, Smith, is Smith? Clay Smith. Uh Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I want the cars. Yeah. Uh, real treat. Now, the museum where the uh, predictor was housed was a, a conical shaped ceiling, kind of like a yurt, and there was a um, ceiling um, daylight skylight at the top. And so I walked in, it was in, in uh, early morning, and the rays of the sun came through this skylight and shone down on the predicta and it looked like blue flames that uh, amazing paint just was was glowing and that so it was almost a spiritual experience like heaven was blessing that car so i had a very intimate uh, time with donna and uh, daryl we had lunch together daryl made sandwiches and uh, and uh, we got, we got down on our hands and knees with a, a, a yardstick and a tape measure and measured, like, like Mark said, dozens of, of accurate <coughs> dimensions so that we could actually build a, a realistic scale kit. So, thanks. Thank you. Lynn's too modest. He spent a lot of time with them. And I have assembled this spiral gun net uh, notebook of all of the dimensions he took. I sent him back with these things. They measure things down to the quarter of an inch. I have dozens of these. You can come up with them later if you want to. But all of these chronicled the inaccuracies of the car to the kit. And boy, there were some serious inaccuracies. Then, Pull up the page. sorry. At that point, of course, it doesn't do any good just to look at the page. You've got to be able to translate that data <coughs> into a useful format so that any attempt to do a correct model or even a kit issue can occur. That's when I called good friend Steve Rolier up and said, Steve, you've got to take these measurements, take the photographs, and do lines on them. <coughs> so here we go. This is some of the measurements. Can you talk this quickly? Yeah, just can yeah, talk it through. Hmm? I've been talking through. <coughs> These are some of the accurate measurements. Mike, microphone. Sorry. Some of the accurate measurements. Here's some of the accurate original me measurements that, that Lynn took. Here are the photographs he took. And this shows the. Hey, how many of you were here before? So some of this will be a little familiar. Uh, but anyway, so this was one of the first drawings Mark sent me. Um, just with his hand-drawn measurements. I think this was even before Lynn had gone to see the car. Um, and he said, can you just put this in a more graphic form? So using my self-taught Photoshop skills, I had done that. Um, these are like three photos of the car profile, front and back. They're not, you know, they're not dead on accurate um, photos, so you can't actually use them to derive measurements. Um, again, this is this is an early attempt to put, put those measurements in, in a readable graphic form, and I probably did, oh, I don't know, probably two or three of these for each um, photo. There's like these measurements, there's one that goes under the car, but I'm not going to show you all of them. There's another one, and then the back, which is again a, a kind of crucial area of inaccuracy on the kit. So that was important to get that kind of right. Um, so then Mark duplicated those three photographs of the real car on the model. 
so we can have a comparison um, between the model and the real car. And so then here are the actual measurements on the model, kind of just duplicating those earlier photographs. Okay, and then back to the real car, we have the real measurements um, scaled down to one twenty-fourth scale, and you know, in essence, just divided by twenty-four. Um, so the green, if you, I don't know if you can see that, but it's like the green is the monogram kit dimensions, and the red is the correct one twenty-fourth scale dimensions. Did that for again, like those same photographs in a, in a multitude of ways. And you can see some of these, like how far off, some of them are not that far off, some of them are just way off. Again, the front with the same, same technique applied, the back, same kind of thing. Um, oh, and then finally, okay, so if you start looking at the car, um, this was a certain amount of guesswork, but I think we also have a measurement of the height of the bubble top. So we could look at, again, I tried to, uh, or we tried to take a photo of the kit from exactly the same angle as the real car was taken from. And again, you can't do it precisely because you don't know what lens they might have been using. You don't know what distance they were standing at. You don't know, you know, you have parallax, you have all that kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, here's the, here's the comparison. You can see like the bubble on the model is just, you know, way too high from what it is on the kit, what it should be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, those kinds of measurements and there are dozens and dozens more of this uh, crude sample of them were necessary, of course, to, to one day do a correct model. Um, a little bit of history. In 1962, Monogram, through hobby stores, campaigned something called the Monogram Custom Car Lot. If you look carefully up, at the top, up here, you can see the 55 Chevy. Somewhere here, there's that 44 pickup that Darrow Starbird worked on. Um, but there's no predictor, of course, because it was too early. This book, which later showed up in Predict the Kit and others, um, was written by Starbird, featured his cars exclusively, and gave definitions of key customizing terms like docking and channeling and French and so forth. This was a big a, a window display. Then they wanted Graham went in further. Oh, I don't have that here. Um, here's an ad that they had to see with the Predict the Kit down here, a little T atop that. And then they went on, of course, to the you know the eight scale stuff about, about the same time. These are all original ads that have been scanned. It seems that the young man grew up a great deal from here to here. <laughs> Those were only about eighteen months apart. <laughs> Look at the preppy haircut, dudes. Now we're going to back up. Now, a little history. More history. Daryl and I have been friends for well, since the early 80s. If you want. Been to this place several times. Um, is Bruce Bruce here? Bruce! 1996, if I have that date correct, Bruce met me at Starbucks Museum. We did a two and a half hour interview with, with Daryl. The two of us there, we visited these cars, we hung out there. It was, he took us to lunch. Piled in one of his cars, he took us to lunch. It was a great time, a real terrific time. Uh, Bruce, I enjoyed your presence. Um, that was one of these several things that went on. Uh, Bruce went home, I went home, got too busy with, with my office and so forth. But always there was this idea in the back of my head that someone had to do a correct kit. So about four and a half or so years ago, I approached Daryl. Let me first. Sorry, sorry. I 
made a proposal to Ed Sexton, who's in, in, uh, in charge of what remained of the monogram a company here in the United States, that I would, uh, they were, we were talking about reissuing the kit yet again in maybe 2009, 2010, and 10 or so. And, um, and I said, I'll, I'll make you, with Bob Wicks help, I said, I'll make you a deal. I will provide a how-to booklet on how to build right out of the box a competent, though not a, certainly not advanced or detailed, version of the car and how to avoid some of the, some of the problems with the body. <coughs> and so I did all these photographs for the one I built. And I sent them off to him, looked them over, monogrammed at that point, they were in that bankruptcy thing, and they I kiboshed the entire project. Um, the, we don't know where the tools are for this, or I think they're with this company that Keeter's now with, but Keeter doesn't know, I mean, no one does. These big beryllium dies are Gordon knows where. So at that point, I closed all, all of that up and deliberated on it further. I went to Starboard about a year and a half later, and I said, look, Daryl, um, Monogram's not gonna do anything with this kit. Sell me the rights to produce it. I want to buy the license, which should be exclusive to me for, for kits, publications, I, the, the whole thing, the whole intellectual property uh, you know, bag. And he did. So I bought the whole thing from him. It wasn't a lot of money. It was probably less than I thought it would be. But I now own all of that. So if Monogram, but it remains a Monogram in Germany now, we're going to issue the kit or Keter's company, they have to come to me to get permission. And I will milk them <laughs> to produce. Now I've got plans to produce a kit. And I'm going to. And it's what there are going to be several as there are going to be several aspects to it. I retained the services of Ed Leisure, whom I'm sure many of you are acquainted with. That's right here. Um, Ed, Ed Leisure with with Bradley Brad Leisure. I'm sorry, with um, with the help of of, of uh, Dave Hadley, we produced this prototype, but very seriously uh, near production. New, new kit lid. Um, it, it taken source from some initial drawings and, and design pros, uh, proposals by Bob Wick. Leisure, of course, did all the color artwork and so forth. And we have that box. Right there. Literally, that's the box. You're welcome to come and look at it afterward. Um, this is pre-production to be sure, but this is the thing we're gonna do because I'm gonna rewrite monogram history. They, in my world, they would have done it right. They would have had a correct kit. It would have been detailed to the best of their competitors. Who's the biggest competitor in terms of high quality model kits in 1964, 63, 64? With monogram, who was it? Johan. Yes, and what was the kit? Yes. So the point was, the point was, you had to do that. Why couldn't Why couldn't Monogram? Correspondents from from the two guys in charge of Monogram. Well, we ran sort of ran out of interest, and things were going to slot cars and drag cars and all the rest of the crap. And they just shut down production. They didn't take it. They didn't correct it, and they knew it. They they <clears throat> deemed it a, a toy, a, a nice plastic toy, and they shut down everything. I'm going to go back and correct that. Monogram at the time offered offered a, a little kit um, through Auto World to, um, uh, you know, a working lights and a working little motor. Um, and so we're, I'm thinking about how that can be interfaced, but we're going to do all of the details that could have been done by a monogram if they hadn't lost their nerve and had been seduced by slot cars and all the rest of that, excuse my French, all that nonsense, <laughs> and decided to do a proper kit to compete with their main, it wasn't their main competitor, it wasn't Revell. And it wasn't AMT. In terms of high detail, it was Johan. Followed closely by Rebel because of Keter. But this is literally the box art. We're gonna I'm gonna hire some people to do some you know construction sheet and so forth. I'm gonna get some 3D people involved. I hope I hope to uh, entice uh, Chris Sobeck to do the, the 3D work. Um, we're gonna do a lot of things and do correct things. Very low production kit because I can't afford it in cooling. Good lord. A couple hundred thousand dollars is not a reasonable fee, but you can do a 3D, and that's what we're going to do. One of the things we're going to do with the original kit, we're going to offer the correct Hemi setup. Who knows what 
Roll heat, you be quiet. Who knows what this carburetor is? That's a Holly. You, very good. I knew you could do it. <laughs> do you know what it's from? You know the year? I uh, had one on my 57 Ford six banger. This, this, is, this particular one is 1960 Falcon. <coughs> Glass bowl. Starboard on the first version of the car ran four of these carburetors on a custom log on his Hemi. Jeez. Okay, so we've tried this once. Lynn, who was the fellow who helped us do the original <coughs> scanning? Lynn was the guy. It turned out pretty well, but could be better. As, as he did all the work on, 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 the, on the slide for me, and it was very generous. But with 3D printing, you can do all of this detail. You can. You can do a separate piece here. Pieces like this are, are going to be made with 3D. The body's going to be 3D. I'm going to hire, um, you know, correct people to do the decals, obviously. I'm thinking of Mark Jones about that. And we're going to do a correct frame and, and all the rest of this. To offer this kit, probably only produce about 100 of them. And they will be expensive, as you can imagine. But for my, for my interest, I want to do a correct kit, as if Monogram could have. And Monogram could have done this. There's nothing on this list of, of um, one twenty fourth. I'm sorry. There's nothing on on this list of things here that could not be done. No detail here wasn't also done on the turbine car kit. Remember, the turbine car kit had separate front fenders, had coiled springs, it had articulated suspension. No reason this car couldn't have had the same if they'd been serious about it. They said they didn't want to open the doors up. You know what the reason was? Because the slight radius of the front would have created, um, you know, die problems. They did the 58th Thunderbird with the, with the curved door and it opened. So it was all just eyewash. It was all nonsense. But they initially intended this to be a honey detail kit and just lost their nerve and walked away. Okay, that's all right. And we're going to do a big predicta. Which, of course, is Bruce Pierce's idea. Here's the proposed artwork, again, based on something Bob Wick has done. I don't know where, where um, Leisure got the image of that kid from someplace. Um, and this is just a 24 scale model blown up. But we're going to mimic that big one and probably only make five of these because these would be frightfully expensive. But see, Monogram, at one time, um, Oh my gosh, I can't remember which one said that. At one time for one or two afternoons, thought about doing a big predictor when they were doing the big do's, the big T, the big tub, and all the rest. And when they lost their nerve on this, lost their nerve to that, never even started. But they thought about it. Remember later, they did the big Corvette, they did the big Jag, and eventually a Trans Am 25 or so years later. But this will, something like a further development of this, will be that big box lid. Okay? Wow. Your box art's not going to say monogram, is it? Oh, yes. Don't they own the trademark for that? No. no? Did, not in connection with this kit. That's what I bought. The kit, but monogram is, is monogram's okay. trademark. Agreed. But in connection with the kit, see, this this is lifted from that period of time. I cleared it with the, with the intellectual property attorney. Okay. Sorry. That's not my specialty in the law. Well, it's the same issue here. It's the same issue here. I'm going to trust he's giving me proper legal advice. I'm not an actual property attorney. If, if he gets sued about that, it'll make the one you buy even more expensive. Can't hear you. <laughs> speak up, speak up, Bruce. Louder. I was just making a little joke here. If you get if you get sued for copyright infringement on Monogram's trademark. That'll make whatever you produce worth a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that, kind of like that candy squirrel paint or plastic. And they'll bankrupt me. Yeah. Well, that's a side issue. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get them done first. We're good with it. So that that's essentially the project. I've got some things to show you up here. In that connection, here is a a thumbnail scan of all the engineering drawings they had on, on the kit. They're, they're here. Um, we have some other. Oh, you didn't, uh, you had a oh bring that forward. Bring that forward. Mark, how much were those first hundred kits or last hundred or whatever? What are they going to cost, do you figure? I don't know my cost yet. I don't have a clue. 
on a factory here. Over this is Leisure's art he sent me. When he did, it's the same thing on the box art. Mm -hmm. He did his art. It's all digital. And I, I had a frame to match the frame of the other one. Just Mark, just to understand the, the, the potential plan for the kit is doing the 3D, 3D print yes. for the body. For nearly everything. No, I'm going to hire a machine to do the wheels, they can chrome plated. Certain parts on the engine will be machined. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll let the contract someone to do them. So the some, of the, some of the parts would be injection molded or just resin cast? Not, not, not injection molded, it's too expensive. Resin cast, machine. Okay. Um, 3D and so forth. 3D, 3D what about the bubble patterns? Uh, that's an interesting question. There is, I've been searching that out. It's Chris Sobeck tells me that you can do clear bubbles, but they are not optically pure. They get shade. <coughs> they have wiggles in them. There's a company, one of my railroad buddies told me, I've not, not searched it out, that will do windshields for trains and anything else in real glass miniatures. Not, I've not sought that out, and I'm sure that's just mind-bendingly expensive, but it's real glass. Now, the original bubble, of course, was Lucite. So I'm going to have to experiment around and get somebody uh, Mark, to... Uh, you know, Sherbert published a magazine article. I used his magazine article to make my bubble top for my mystery. I'm thinking he's doing so to your own. Sure. It's easy. Well, and I will happily rely upon your help with that, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> you just volunteered. <laughs> you should not have said that. <laughs> I, I think you've just become part of the predictive project, dude. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about that. Um, the price just went up. <laughs> price did just go up. I wanted to summarize the further developments in this kit because it's the last time we're meeting here. And we produced seven, six or seven of these things before. When we talked about the intricate parts of history um, that have not, have not been told before. We're not told before I discovered Um this is obsessional. I hope I get it done in my lifetime. I'm 72. I'm in good health, except for a bad leg, but otherwise I'm in good health. And uh, I'm going to try and get some investors involved with me and so forth. It's going to take some money to do this. Not a lot, but or the, maybe, probably more than I have. Um, I'm going to turn to Bob Wick for his help in doing dimensional work on the frame, the frame and chassis and so forth. Um, there are all sorts of, of, of really terrific experts that I'm going to try to entice, um, one might say commercially seduce, and to come in working with me on this project. Um, it'll be announced, of course, on the website, which we're about to update. Um, and I'll, if you want to check in with that, uh, that website from time to time, to certainly learn about this. And I'll talk about any legal difficulties I run into. Um, but that's where we are, essentially. Uh, there is, oh, one more thing. They did, they did adverts like this in the, in the mid 60s. You notice the top center one is the kit version they did. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to reproduce these and modify that to rep to represent the kit that have opening doors, for instance. When we do the um, the display box, I don't have one here. The images on the side will show the further details of the kit opening doors correctly detailed hemi and so forth. You see, all that kind of thing will, will be done um, to sort of go back and play with history a little bit to show what could have been done and it could have been done. If, if a drone could do it, certainly monogram, but they had more revenue than, than, than Hanley did over there. Just a matter of they lost the will or they got you know, distracted by other product lines and so forth. I mean, I don't know all the reasons. I've got an extensive library of correspondence with Bob, Bob Reeder and the other guy. Bruce, who's the other guy there? At Ben Monogram, it was Reader and the other fellow. Hanley. Speak up. Hanley. No, he was with no. Oh, Bob Johnson. No, he was later. Um, um, when Sexton was it? No, they're, they're all later. I'm talking about the original guys that formed the company. It was yeah. there was anyway. Uh, that doesn't okay. matter. But I have an extensive library of correspondence with him starting in about 19 in the early 80s, and that's when they spilled the guts. He told me all the inside secrets of of how the car was made, the kit was made and why it didn't turn out better, and their confessions about why they didn't have opening doors, why the suspension is toy-like. I mean, on a good day, it's toy-like. 
big rod came forward and moved this thing on the front. I mean, come on. The, the engine, if that's a Hemi, if that's a Hemi, I'm, you know, I'm somebody else. I mean, it's not a Hemi. Um, anyway, it's a very interesting background. I'll publish everything online, of course. I have, somewhere here, I have a, I have a, I wanted to pass this around, I didn't have time to introduce it, but I have a, I thought I had, well, I don't, I thought I had a notepad here. I, I would like to get your names, if you want to be on, on the email list, I certainly would like to have that, if we can find a piece of paper. Maybe a piece of your paper there. Oh, please. Why don't we circulate something around there? That's very nice. Thank you. If you would just write, make sure I have your correct email address, because that's all I'll be in touch with you. So, will this be a common kit at your next GSL? You are a bad man. You are just, just saying. You are genuinely evil. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't you just circulate over to us? It's just started right there. Hand me those two. Let's do my love. Show those two. Then there. See the yellow and the red one? One of the things that ingratiated me to uh, the Hanley. Is that about 25 years ago when eBay was just starting out? Thank you. I had a search. They, they have a search capability. They have a search capability uh, on eBay, and I put predict in their predict kits. These two popped up. A company in Hong Kong in the late 60s took the original kit and did a replicate, sort of. These things, the basic dimensions match perfectly. One's one's up. Let's see. That's just a toy. This is a friction toy. That's the original box. Handy didn't know about these things. He became irate on the phone when I sent him pictures of these. He had no idea that the company had been ripped off. This came from Amsterdam. This came from Australia. Hmm. This is simply paid and shipped here. But it's fascinating to see these because it clearly, you clearly know what it is. There's your friction capability underneath. But he's fell on the floor. He's fell on the floor by your right foot. A black one. No. There you go. You'll notice that there's a driver and a driver has a traditional steering wheel. Oh. True story. So come up look at him. You were both Michael Vaughn. Speak up. Microphone. Sorry. <laughs> You're welcome to come up and look at these, my friends. And look over the uh, look over the engineering drawings. And look over the photographs of this book that we'll be doing. It's a real hot, basic craftsmanship kind of book. But it'll get you past most of the problems of assembling this, this kit from the original parts. So you're welcome to have a look. Take a look at the, at the anomalies and the rear fins of this. See how terrible it is, and see how pretty the plastic is when you just wax it. It's a beautiful color. It's just it didn't work. And so the first thousand are highly valuable these days. It used to be very much at all, but now it's five or six hundred dollars for an unbilled wow. um, pearl red one on, on eBay. And I'm assuming I've got all mine. I, I have four or five of them. I don't need any more. But I, so I've never. Here's the original box you take. It sat, well, sort of, it sat like that from the factory, as they would send the uh, base, you know, the base is out of the, in the model itself. So, that's it. It's kind of short today, but I wanted to bring you up to date. Please fill that list out wherever the darn thing is right now and get it back to me with your email addresses, and I'll get you on the list. Also, tell you the website's updated, which will be in about two months. That's it, guys. Thank you for coming. Woo!